everybody. Do you remember the days when all BMW had to do to create controversy with one of their cars was to put a turbo in it? Do you miss those days? I do. In any case, back in 2011, even the presence of forced induction was not enough to stop the 1 Series M Coupe from collecting all the awards. Even though today it is still looked down upon by those who consider it to be simply a part spin special and not a proper M car, the 1M was an instant hit. A cult classic if ever there were one, and I would say one of the wildest and most interesting BMWs of recent years. It took a long time for me to get my hands on a 1M, and when I at long last did, I have to say I was somewhat nervous because this was a car that had a reputation that was so great I was fearful it would have been impossible for it to live up to it. And today you'd actually have to spend double or triple the money of the then contemporary E92 M3 to get yourself into the technically lesser 1M. The naming of that car, 1 Series M Coupe, was always a source of equal parts controversy and amusement. There are those who said the only reason it wasn't called the M1 is to avoid confusion with BMW's 1970s supercar. However, there are also those who say it's simply because this isn't a proper M car. And the case for the prosecution there? Well, simple. It didn't have a proper M engine, instead featuring a version of the N54, BMW's 3.0-litre twin-turbocharged straight-six as seen in the Z4 S-Drive 35 IS. A fine engine by all accounts, but as far as many were concerned, simply not bespoke enough to earn the car the title of a true M. What we then have today is maybe the greatest case of what if ever. For I am driving the car, it could be argued BMW were simply afraid to build. This is a 1 Series M Coupe with an E92 M3's V8. This should be good. And don't forget, if you're looking to buy a 1 Series M Coupe, an M3, or some weird, crazy hybrid of the pair, then make sure to do a car vertical search. The super-powered super search that's just had a rebranding with new, even easier to read than before reports, and a new colour scheme for their mascots. A car vertical search will tell you all the stuff you want to know about any potential used car purchase, including accident damage, mileage discrepancies, usage as a taxi, and outstanding finance. All you need is just 60 seconds and a reg plate or a VIN number. Car Vertical will work on both desktop or as a mobile app for both Android and Apple. To get 10% off the service, don't forget to follow my link in the description down below or use my discount code, which is JM. And now, back to the action. Although you might think it, this is actually far from a unique concept. There are actually a number of vehicles out there running a similar setup. And the reason for this is that it's actually not anywhere near as complicated as you might imagine. This generation of 1 Series, the E87, E82, so on and so forth, is mechanically very closely related to the E90 and E92 Generation 3 Series, to the point that a great number of 3 Series parts will simply bolt on, including those from the M3. Case in point, my old 130i hatchback actually had the suspension arms from an M3. You just take the old ones off, put the new ones on, and then the only thing you need to change is the sensor that tells the Xenon lights where they need to point. That's it. This car didn't actually start life as a 1 Series M Coupe. That would have been a needlessly expensive starting point, and as far as I'm concerned, a waste of a fairly rare and valuable car. It has been given all of the cosmetic pieces from a 1M, genuine BMW items, and the mechanicals have come from a salvaged M3. The build was done by a place called M-Craft, located near Norwich. It was commissioned just before lockdown, allegedly for a customer over in Germany. And that does confuse me quite a bit, because the one thing I know about Germany is that right-hand drive cars are essentially illegal there. In any case, global events got in the way and prevented him from taking delivery of the car. It was then taken on by another gentleman who had it until he sadly passed away. It was then, a year ago, in November, that its current owner, John, bought it, having been eyeing up the 1M but being worried that with those now being essentially a collector's item, he'd wind up with a car he'd be afraid of using. As soon as he saw this for sale, and at a price lower than a genuine 1M, he thought it was a no-brainer. 
The thing that really struck me as soon as I saw this car was just how well put together it is and how OEM the entire thing looks. There are very few giveaways. This is not a genuine BMW product from top to bottom. The only ones I can see are the fact that the nav system up here you'd never have got in a 1 Series and it's a later M3 based nav system which has been upgraded with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, making this a very usable car. It even has EDC dampers, though combined with KW springs which are height adjustable and you've still got all the settings down here so you can have the car in comfort, sport or sport plus. The M button on the wheel still works, the dash does exactly what it should and nothing in here has given me an error, a warning or anything else. The engine is currently running standard power but does need a tune to accommodate for the non-standard exhaust. The DCT gearbox has received the very popular upgrade of a map from the M3 GTS so it responds nicely. In automatic mode it'll shift gears quick enough but I've been driving it the whole time in manual and though it's not quite got the bite of a later system it is very pleasant, very responsive and I know there will be people out there who'd love to see this with a manual in, but the fact is, it wasn't built that way, and controversial though I know it might be, I think this engine really does work better with a dual clutch. You get an extra ratio so you can keep it in that power band a little bit easier, and this gearbox does respond really well. Although the engine swap does mean the car is now up quite a bit in terms of power, from 335 horses to more like 420, that is if you believe BMW's figures, it is actually now down on torque. From a peak with overboost of 369 pound foot, that's 500 newton meters, to around 295 or 400 newton meters. But do any of you care? Anyone? No, didn't think so. Do you want to see me stop talking and give it the beans? Yes, I hear you cry, and I am only too happy to oblige. honestly find it impossible to believe that there isn't a car just like this tucked in the back of a factory somewhere in Munich. Somebody must have had an idea to create a car like this, surely. After all, the rear subframe from an M3 will bolt directly onto the chassis of a 1 Series, and it's a similar story up the front. It really isn't all that hard to do. Even the engine bay doesn't look that crammed in because your regular car has an engine six cylinders long and this is only four cylinders long. It also is an engine that really does come alive in a car that is as light as this. Exact weight figure for this car? I really don't know, but let's just call it similar to an E46 M3 and you're probably on the money. It is a living legend, this thing, and a real to those who think that turbocharged power is required for performance and more accurately enjoyment it's just not even revving this thing out is actually a little bit difficult on occasion because it's got so much go but more importantly it's got response it's got ability and it's got the noise oh it's got the noise Matron, you naughty car, you. I love it. Although, it's not perfect. The last time I drove the 1 Series M Coupe, I recall it being a razor sharp affair. This doesn't feel that way at all. There's a real sense of looseness to the front end. It feels a little bit disconnected. When I did start to put my foot down, there was a moment 
of concern. It didn't feel like the car was really doing what I wanted it to do. The back end similarly does feel a little bit on edge. Not that it's braking traction, I think in these conditions, and with two 7.5 wide rear tires, 255 fronts in case you're wondering, it would be relatively difficult. But it's got a sort of wandering feeling about it. Very disconcerting. I think this is still a car that requires a fair bit of setup. And if anything, when I report back to John, because I know he wants my feedback on the car, I'm gonna tell him, ignore what the M3 did. Instead, look at what the 1M did. That, I think, in terms of handling, should be the benchmark. The damping, though, is pretty much spot on. I took it out of comfort and put it in sport to see if it would help with the car's waywardness and it hasn't really done all that much. But even so, it's not overly firm. Actually, I think of late I've driven plenty of cars that are firmer than this in their comfort mode. It does have aircon and I was about to complain about it, but then I realized it hadn't been turned on and it would help, wouldn't it, if I pressed the button for it. Visibility is pretty good and honestly, in terms of all the stuff like interior space, storage and, you know, infotainment, it is essentially, barring the little screen up here, the same as any other 1 Series, M or otherwise. Which is to say that it's not particularly exciting in here, a festival of noir, but uh, it's all logically laid out and just about everything works. In fact, the one button in here that does not work is the traction control off button up here because it's now down here, having been pinched from the M3. And in fact, this little setup down here, which gives you also the settings for the gearbox, is one of the very, very few pieces I don't like, because it does look like somebody's taken a hacksaw to the console and glued these in, because that's almost certainly exactly what somebody has done. Despite the fact it is sort of between exhaust setups, shall we say, it's not actually anywhere near as raucous as I thought. You'd certainly not sneak up on anyone in it, but I love the whole cue car vibe that it's got going on. Although John tells me that of all the cars he's owned, which includes a plethora of M cars, this is the one that by far attracts the most attention. And I suppose it would, because if you know your cars, you'd know this was something special even before you heard it start up. And if you saw this going past, you'd think, hmm, that's, uh, that's not quite right. But you know what? It is right. It is so very, very right. I had the suspicion before, and the drive has only confirmed it, that there is just one simple reason BMW never made a car like this. Because after they had, trying to convince anybody to go into an M3, and certainly when they arrived, the M4 and turbocharged M3, that would have been very, very difficult indeed. Once upon a time, there was a guy who apparently said he could make one of these cars for essentially about 30 grand. However, I believe that is no longer the case. If anything, it's the cost of the 1 Series M bits that has actually gone up rather than the M3. Those were always fairly plentiful and have only continued to be crashed in the years since. However, as people have begun to turn more and more 1 Series into 1M replicas, the stockpile of original bits, body parts, bumpers and the like in particular has become smaller and prices higher. I also appreciate the efforts made in trying to keep this car as OEM and OEM looking as possible. Even the brakes are the standard M3 items, and uh, for road use, I can't really imagine any need to change them. The pedals a little on the light side requires a little bit of travel, and it's not exactly full of feel, but they more than do the job. You even get the M3's MDM traction control mode, which is essentially a halfway house between on and off. In other words, it'll let you have a little bit more of a play before it intervenes, but it will still save you when it comes to it. And you do play it like a musical instrument. John and I were also talking, and I know I've mentioned this in several other videos recently, that one of the benefits of having this nice, naturally aspirated and super linear engine, which I'm going to enjoy for a second, is that it's really really easy to modulate the power. You see, with the turbo lumps, you put your foot down at 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, the effect is essentially exactly the same. Whereas this, at five, is twice the engine. It is at two and a half. And actually, you can still change up at four, four and a half, and have a great time. You still feel the power building. You just change up when you want. And the best thing about that 
As we go up a gear, you get to go down a gear. It's not stupidly fast, this thing. Like the M3, it makes, I think, a little bit more noise than Ford Momentum. There is a good chance that a regular 1M coupe, especially if you tuned it, would actually be quicker. But I don't care. This is an event. That being said, if this were a genuine OEM BMW product, I'd certainly be giving it a lot more stick for the suspension. It needs finessing, the steering needs sorting out, it needs sharpening up, desperately. But this isn't an OEM BMW product. It's not finished, it's a work in progress. And as I know that greatness can be achieved in terms of the handling, I'm gonna just pretend that uh, that is incoming. And when that's sorted, what John is going to have for the price of the ropiest, most dog-eared Ferrari you could possibly imagine is easily one of the coolest things on the road despite my certainly incurable automotive addiction, I have still to date owned more BMWs than any other car brand. Nine, I think, in total. But as a BMW fan, it is a little bit difficult to get excited about much of the current lineup. However, there is absolutely nothing stopping me from buying an old BMW. And when you get back in stuff like this, I am reminded of all the reasons I fell in love with the brand in the first place. And so for that reason, this gets a great big thumbs up from me. So that I think is all I really have to say on the matter. I wanna say a huge thanks to John for bringing his car out and as ever to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.